Good morning, everyone. Morning and welcome to First Church United Church of Christ in downtown Phoenix. Feels an extra uh, dose of privilege to be in an air-conditioned space today. Um, it has felt like indeed the world is on fire, and there's a book by the same title as well. So it's good to be here and to also know that as a church, we're a heat respite cooling center and we make sandwiches together after church uh, for our friends to come and cool off and have something to eat and so if you're able to stay around and to join us uh, for that uh, service everybody's welcome who's here to to make their way over to the hall together special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us here today we're so glad that you're here welcome uh, to first church whether you're here for the first time or you've come many times, we're glad that you've come to be with us in this way and to be present here in the sanctuary. Special welcome to those of you who are also gathering online virtually. We welcome you here to... <laughs> we hope Sophie and Nicole are also watching today. We do, um, although you may be moving in, but we certainly miss you um, and we're so delighted that we were able to just pray with you last week as you made your way to your new home. So welcome everybody to this time together um, to be in worship. Also another announcement or two that we have today um, besides the making sandwiches, um, if you want to go tubing and cool off, that's sounding better and better on Saturday. Um, and Adam is here and Grace is here if you have questions about the tubing and when they're meeting. Uh, everyone's most welcome to join them. And then we're going to have a, a movie viewing the letter that was written by Pope Francis and to hear um, from different people all over the world um, about the effects of climate change in their lives. We'll have dinner together and then we're going to discuss uh, the movie. So we hope you'll mark your calendars for that and join us. And it's Saturday, July the 22nd. And I think most of our visitors got their bags already when they came in. If you have a welcome bag, there's a yellow card that's on there. And if you want to sign your name to it, and you can place that in the offering basket when it comes around, if you'd like to leave your information and mark your presence today with us. We start a new theme for this month of July, and we're going to be friends talking faith. So it's a series of... It's a panel. You can see the chairs are ready to go. So some of our friends, your friends at First Church, are going to come and have a dialogue about faith together. And so it'll be wonderful to hear from them, and I'm sure that you'll relate um, from, from some of their responses. So we're going to dialogue together in the month of July. Invite you to bring yourself present into this place and space. We spend a lot of time being busy, lots of noise, in service in this church, lots of us. And so might today be a time for you just to come and to be and to recharge and to connect again with God. And so I invite you to take a deep breath, a cleansing breath, and to exhale all the anxiety and angst and fears of the world and whatever you might be carrying personally in your own life or for your family or friends. And to breathe in the gift that is God, the spirit that lives within. And as you do that, we'll bring ourselves into sacred space through the ringing of the bell. God, we come into this time of worship together to seek you, to seek you in our lives, to be reminded that you are our center, that you are with us, that you are present, that you love us just as we are. And we come to offer ourselves in worship to you and to service to one another. We bring ourselves into this time of worship and to honor and to praise you this day. 
In your name, in your presence, in Christ we pray. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit to sing. Oh
Church, will you join me in the, oh, cool. I'm going to do call to community right now. We come to worship hungry and thirsty, God who nourishes. Give us in this worship. God who nourishes. Give us in these God who nourishes us, feeds us in these thoughts. God who nourishes, feed us in our bodies and spirits. Amen. This is the prayer of transformation this morning. The label Christian is sometimes very hard to wear. We feel shame and embarrassment at the atrocities committed in its name. We don't recognize it when it arrives in the form of nationalism. Yet we find ourselves here in church today. We are seekers on the journey with far more questions than answers. We pray together and seek transformation as a collective Christian community. So please pray with me. God, we're confused. Do we throw everything out and start over? Do we confess our past and move on? Do we ignore what we don't like and embrace what we do? We seek to live into the example of Christ who included everything and everyone. We desire a just world. For the times that the Christian faith acted and responded in any other way, we seek your forgiveness. Help us to recognize our past and claim the way of Christ anew. Help us to be peacemakers, bridge builders, 
and relationship stores, human and non-human alike. Amen. God sees our hearts and our desire for unity, peace, and equity. God forgives us and persuades us to create the common good together. A reading from Acts and Romans. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus and looked for Saul. We found him and brought him back to Antioch. And they were there a whole year, meeting with the church and teaching a lot of people. It was in Antioch that the disciples were for the first ta time called Christians. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master. Cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends, and when they're happy, share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, give him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. I'll be read I will be reading in Mandarin Chinese, Acts uh, chapter eleven, twenty-five to twenty-six. 使徒行传十一章第二十五节到二十六节。后来他到大树去找扫罗。找到了，就带他到安提亚，足足有一年。他们一同在教会聚集，教导了许多人。门徒称为基督徒，是从安提亚开始的。Romans chapter twelve verses nine to twenty-one。罗马书十二章第九节到二十一节。爱不可虚伪，恶要厌恶，善要持守。要以守足之爱彼此相亲用恭敬的心互相礼让只可祝福不可救主亲爱的不要为自己伸冤
We made Spencer busy so I could do this. <laughs> We're going to sit down. We want to use the chairs? We can use the chairs. And Delilah is going to be one of the participants in, the, in two weeks? One week. One week. So come back when Delilah tells us. She's going to talk here, too. Actually, I'm going to ask you. You could help me with a prop real fast. Have you ever played with dominoes? Yeah, okay. So why don't we put the dominoes down right here? Is that okay? You help All right, got to try and put it up without making them fall over yet. Can you help me put them together in a line? Now, Delilah, when um, they were reading the scripture, something that I was thinking about was the concept of love in action. I just want to tell you this. Um, when I, s just what? Flip it over this way. Here, I'll let you be the engineer of this. How about that? Um, when I say love in action, what do you think that means? Relationship. Like when you, like, get married or something. <laughs> yeah, that is love in action. Um, so why don't we step back? What does, what does uh, love mean? What does it mean when you love someone? Um, you, when you love someone, them for your life. Yeah, so um, I'm thinking like you have family that loves you, you have friends that love you. So when I say love in action, I'm meaning putting love into different actions. Are there ways that we can show people that we love them? What are, what are some ways that we can show people that we love them? Doing a love signal. A love signal. What's a love signal? When you do, like, when you do language with your hands. Oh. Yeah, yeah, like saying, like doing this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like telling someone that you love them. Are there things that we can do for others? Maybe, like, write a note and tell them how much we appreciate them. Um, we can. What about for strangers? What are ways that we can show strangers that we love them? You don't, you don't know. How about we smile at them like Jackson? <gasps> Do you like smiling? Is that the way you show love? <laughs> show us your smile. Show us your smile. Can you wave? We've been practicing waving. Can you wave? Maybe? No? That's okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, so we can smile at them, maybe hold the door open. Um, maybe even when we're at a drive through we can pay for the people behind us. Um, and one of the cool things about loving people is a lot of times when we put love into action, it's a lot easier for those people to then take that love and turn around and love others as well. That's not always the case, but most of the time it's a lot easier to then show that love. So when you pay for someone's uh, meal right behind you, it's really easy then to think, wow, that was really nice, the money that I was gonna spend on my meal. Maybe I can love the people behind us and pay for their meal. And then it just keeps going and going and going. And these dominoes are not working the way that they need to right now, but that's okay. We can just em. stop like this, ready? So when we love one person and show them love because God first loved us, and we have God's image and God's love in each of us. So when we take that love and we love others, it creates this ripple effect. And then when we love others, it's a lot easier to create change in this world. So when you think about loving others, I want you to think about the domino effect that it can have on, on not just the person you're loving, but other people as well too. So... With this in mind, what are some ways that you can show um, someone that you, you love them today? Can you think of, you don't have to tell me, but I just want you to think of some ways that you can show others that you love them today. All right? Delana made sandwiches every <gasps> Sunday so far. That's a good way of showing your neighbor that you love them. All right, will you pray with me real fast? 
dear God, I just thank you for loving each of us and putting your image in each of us. Um, and when we share that love with our neighbors, um, we see you in them. And it's so much easier to love and create change um, when we love others. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You have a big
Okay, deep breath, you four. <sighs> it's always hard to be first, right? <laughs> As part of this. So first of all, Doug, Lori, Victor, Roger, thank you for saying yes. And um, just agreeing to be here today and to just talk a little bit about faith. And in t also in front of um, this Christian community, which we all call home here. And I really wanted to just, I think, give all of us an opportunity to have this conversation uh, throughout this month. Um, there's a lot that's going on in our world, and uh, we get the opportunity sometimes in small groups um, to talk to one another. And more briefly, I think, on Sunday mornings, uh, we get busy either um, leaving or making sandwiches or have other things on. And so a way for people um, to really engage in a conversation of Christ Christian faith um, with people as um, a part of this, this community and to hear from each other in this, in this space. None of us have arrived here today. We all come from different backgrounds and places and those sort of backgrounds have an influence on, on our everyday thinking and how we respond and interact. And some of that background that we all have, and whether it was religious or non-religious, um, we default back to it from time to time. Um, it, it naturally sort of comes up because we've been influenced in a particular way. And so I want to start with that sort of question um, for the four of you, and that is, what is your, your faith or Christian background, religious uh, or non-religious, and just share with us briefly about that. Doesn't matter. <laughs> all right. You just uh, got elected. <laughs> all right. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, well, Susan, you kind of know my background because we've talked a little bit, but uh, everyone else doesn't. Um, I was raised in a Christian, like a fundamentalist Christian home. I hate to use that word fundamentalist, but uh, my parents, they, as I got older, they kind of continually got more and more religious. And I guess some of that rubbed off on me. Um, when I was 15, I got saved. Um, when I was 20, I went off to college and thought about going to like Bible college. But um, the next year, I moved out to Arizona, and um, I lost my faith because of some life circumstances and the political climate of the time. It was the early 2000s, and um, uh, let's see, I uh, I've never had any formal rel religious training or anything like that. I just studied some a little bit in school and uh, study on my own as well. But um, I've been agnostic, atheist, and I've come back to Christianity again and again, so that's why I'm here right now. Thanks, Victor. Yeah. Good morning. Can you hear me? Um, I really enjoy reading, or I've had for a season, reading books by Joan Didion, because she has a beautiful way of describing situation or a characterization and um, in one of her stories she introduced her ca a character as having come out of the bleak wild of prairie fundamentalism and when I read that I thought well that's it. that's that's me and the bleak wild is very apt you know our church the church that I um, grew up in and stayed in until I was 17, although I had a very difficult time um, believing. Uh, I just put on a mask and behaved so that I could survive in my peer group. Um, it was a holiness church. It was relatively early. It was established in 1903 in Pilot Point, Texas. And I looked that up on the map, and it doesn't get much more bleak than that. Uh, <laughs> Um, it was a, a holiness church. Um, the way I understand what they were talking about, uh, holiness uh, is a second act of grace. Um, first is salvation, to ask forgiveness for your sins. Generally, that had to be a public, um, uh, I'll call it performance, but a public um, going forward to the altar and confessing our sins, not just to Jesus or to God, but to other people. 
I remember an elder coming up to me and just, you know, I was down there because I got caught doing something and in order to survive at home, I had to go to the altar, you know? And um, he said, what did you do wrong, Raji? What did you do wrong? Um, so I had to tell him. And it's horrible to do to a uh, child who's seven or eight years old. The second act is an act of, second act of grace is um, sanctification. And after you've been saved, you move on to sanctification over a period of time. And what that's supposed to do is remove your carnal nature. Now, that was mainly, um, the easiest way to follow that was to follow the rules and regulations of the church. Um, because that was all behavioral and people People observed that. No smoking, no drinking, no going to movies. Um, no buying and selling on Sunday. Women were not allowed to wear makeup. Um, that sort of thing. Slacks, never. Um, no mixed bathing, which was an interesting one. Men and women were not allowed to swim in the same swimming pool together. So um, those were the rules. And if you follow those rules, you could practically behave any way you, you your behavior didn't necessarily need to change as long as you followed the rules. So it wasn't really a, what I would consider a holy form of sanctification. And uh, that's what I grew up with. Um, that's where I come from. Thank you. Lori clearly wants to be lost. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more to say. <laughs> So I was uh, raised in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, which is a close um, uh, sister denomination to the United Church of Christ. Uh, but I, uh, maybe more important, I was raised in uh, Idaho. And uh, so in that very red state, uh, the conservatism uh, uh, influenced everything, including um, the church I was a part of. And yet, despite that, there were always these people that you know, I was looking for a father figure because my dad was mostly absent because of uh, illness, uh, both mental and physical, and looking for uh, exemplars of Christian faith. So I was able to find some of these people in this fairly conservative church. One of them that I think of um, uh, is uh, Les Brown. He was my pastor, and I remember he, um, he could play the blues trumpet without a trumpet, just with his lips. <laughs> and uh, he preached a sermon one Sunday that made me sit up and pay attention. I don't remember many sermons that I've heard in my life. I don't even remember sermons that I've preached in my life. Amen. But I remember this one. Um, and he quoted extensively from the letter uh, from Birmingham jail from Martin Luther King Jr. And I had to ask my mother, why are people so upset? And another person that was a real influence uh, for me was uh, Eddie Sutton. He was the coach of um, the uh, junior college team in my town. He went on to be uh, uh, installed in the uh, um, National Hall of Basketball fame because he co uh, coached at Creighton and uh, Kentucky and uh, Oklahoma State, but um, he was a member of my church and he brought his black players that he recruited to my little lily white church. And uh, it, it caused a bit of a kerfuffle, um, but I remember the church really welcoming them in some surprising ways. And I don't know whether that was because they were Christian or because they were sports fans. These uh, players um, wow. put Twin Falls, Idaho on the map uh, with a championship team. So it was hard to cheer for them on Friday night and then shun them on Sunday morning. One of the really influential poems for me uh, was by a disciple poet, uh, Edwin Markham. Uh, and it goes, uh, he uh, drew a circle that shut me out, heretic rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that brought him in. So for me, Christian faith has always been uh, a willingness to draw bigger circles, which the Supreme Court did not do this week. Right. 
And, um, and one of the ways that happened for me was um, an assignment uh, when I was in seminary to go visit another uh, tradition besides your own. So I chose a Jewish synagogue. And I, I think I had never really asked myself, what's it mean to be a Christian? It was just the water that I swam in uh, all the time. But um, I started asking, you know, why do they do what they do? Why do they say what they say? And it made me ask that about myself. Why do I do what I do? Why do I say what I say? And uh, so that was a real influence for me. Thank you, Doug. I really didn't want to go last. I just wanted to hear what everybody else had to say. Um, I really didn't think a lot about what I was going to say today, but yet I kind of did. Um, today's going to be the first day that I've ever publicly acknowledged some things. And we all have a story. Everybody in this congregation has a story and things that have happened in our lives that have been good and bad and painful, uh, insightful, loving, all those things, right? It's on a continuum. And my faith growing up in the church was kind of like that. There was a lot of good stuff that happened in that church, those churches that I was involved in, which were pretty evangelical. I got saved more times than I can count. I even got sanctified a few times. Ended up going to a Christian college after going to uh, a very liberal college where Brandon also attended. Um, and my life was just kind of going back and forth, back and forth, trying to find God. Uh, being told what God was and what I had to do to have a relationship, but never really achieving that. And God was used to protect people that were doing some really bad things to me and to others. And so I kept searching, and I kept searching, even though Sunday after Sunday I would be in a congregation where there were people that were abusing me in very serious ways for very many years. And at some point, I just kind of walked away and said, that's enough. I don't want anything more to do with your God. But there was something about this guy called Jesus that stuck in my mind through all of this. And I knew that Jesus wasn't these people. And I also knew there were some good people there, too. But I kind of held on to this Jesus guy and chose to be a social worker, not a Christian, but a social worker, because I wanted to be like Jesus. I didn't want to be like all these other people. So I've been a social worker for about 40 years, started when I was very young, and I have no regrets about that. And each time something major has happened in my life, like you, most of you know, I recently got married, um, something that people are probably still praying for me about. <laughs> but every time something major occurs in my life, it kind of takes me back. And I start to go through all those experiences again and again. And each time healing does take place, and this time, it's taken me to a closer place with God. That's my road. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing about your backgrounds. And I hope, too, that you are thinking about your own backgrounds and what has brought you to where you are today as they answer the questions I'm sure you are for yourself and what you might say. One of the famous quotes from Gandhi is this. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. I find that quote to be really uh, provocative and a really good way to, to go into the next question, that um, Christianity doesn't have a very good track record. Um, and historically, and also right now, that white Christian nationalism has gotten such a platform. And uh, I think as maybe a response to all that's going on in the world, uh, Brian McLaren wrote a book. Um, then some of us studied that book together in the church. And the title of the book is, Why Do You Stay Christian? And that's my question for you. Okay. Uh, there's a lot, yeah, there are a lot of, uh, you know, lousy Christians out there, but I mean, I look at the Bible and you see like who the disciples were and there were a bunch of, you know, drunks and fishermen that, you know, shouldn't even be, shouldn't have even been hanging out with Jesus. But I mean, that's who Christians are and, and why I stay Christian. I mean, I haven't stayed Christian, but the reason I am now is because I look at Jesus and I look at God and I look at, you know, the goodness of that. But I, the thing that I don't understand is why the world is the way it is, but you know, it's, it's uh it's just one of those things but um 
Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead, Lori. Um, well, the first thing I tell when I tell people I'm a Christian, I tell them I go to a liberal and progressive church because I don't want them to think I'm like one of those other people, right? <laughs> first thing I say. <laughs> Still saying it today. Um, I stay Christian because I don't believe there's only one way to God. I believe that the Buddhists, the Muslims, everybody has a way to God. <clears throat> I don't think we're an exclusive club, but I choose to have the faith I have in, in Christ. Um, and that's my role model. And that's why I stay Christian. It's pretty simple. Thanks. I could go on about this forever. Um, so I'll try to keep it as simple as possible because that usually is the best thing that works for me. Uh, I am Christian. I've never really stayed Christian until I came to First Church. Um, uh, but uh, I'm grateful for the dent that my childhood left in me because it, it put in me an insatiable curiosity to find some resolution in my life, spiritual resolution. And um, I was at a point in my life where I had to change everything if I was going to live emotionally, spiritually, uh, mentally. And... Uh, through some sort of divine intervention, I found this church through a series of amazing circumstances. And um, interestingly, every time I would drive up Central, I'd look when you could still see the church, I would drive up Central and look at this building and say, that's a beautiful building. It looked like it dropped out of the sky from New England. <laughs> I'm going to go over there sometime and visit it or at least find out if it's a museum or it's an actual church. And uh, as God would have it, I ended up here. And that was in 2002, and I'm, I'm still here. As far as being a Christian, um, a good friend of mine, one of my mentors, said there are many ways up that mountain. And being a Christian, to me, is just following Jesus the Christ. And that example, that human example of, of how to treat our fellow man and how to treat ourselves. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, there have been days when I just want to uh, divorce myself completely from Christianity. I think the worst thing that ever happened to us when we, was when we uh, were established as the state church and had power, and power corrupted us absolutely. Um, but I l I've come to terms with it a little bit more in that um, Richard Rohr has been doing uh, some meditations on the shadow side, and I think everything of substance and significance has a, a shadow side. And the more substance, the more significance there is, the deeper the shadow is. So I think um, wine is a wonderful gift of creation, but many of us have been addicted to alcohol, and it has a real shadow side. But I'm not giving up wine. Uh, I think sex is a great gift of creation, uh, but many of us have been abused sexually. Um, but I'm determined not to give up sex. <laughs> and the same thing with uh, my Christian faith. It's got a real deep shadow to it, uh, but um, that's a mark of its significance, I think. So rather than uh, dispense of it, I'm trying to... Um, explore the shadow and uh, understand it, how it might be enlightening despite that shadow. Thank you, Doug. One of the things you mentioned is when Christianity became this uh, uh, national uh, sort of religion, it goes all the way back to Constantine in 312 when Constantine had this conversion and it, we became the, the religi religion of the empire. And What's so strange about that is that we know that Jesus stood up to empire against the oppression and violence of the Roman Empire. So I, I don't know if Jesus had in mind creating a religion. I think it was more a way of being, a way of being in the world, a way of connecting with God and our neighbors, love your neighbor as yourself. And um, both of the, the scripture readings, it was a little hard to find some that had something to do with Christianity. 
Um, and so I just thought, let's just point to a couple in scripture. One is in Antioch, the first time that the, they're called Christians um, gathering in a community. Maybe it's sort of like our small groups when we meet in homes and we say, hey, what are we? Oh, I guess we follow Christ, so we're, we're, we're Christians, I guess. Maybe we should call ourselves the Jesusites or something. I don't know. Give ourselves a new name, the followers of Jesus. Um, and then the other one, which I think somebody took some liberty to make a title to uh, that particular section in, in Romans that we read, it says the true marks of, of, of a Christian, which they weren't too bad. I think we agreed with most of them that were read there today. But it, but it is a challenge um, to, I think, say, yeah, um, I, I'm a Christian. If you didn't answer it in the last question, I think, or want to explain, expound or expand a little bit on it is is what does it mean um, then for you to call yourself a Christian? Working. Uh, it means accountability. To me to be a Christian means accountability. Uh, many of you know I work in prisons and have been there for a long time and I meet people that have done some really horrific things. Um, and I've seen once people take accountability for their lives and what they've done, that it helps them. They heal, and people around them can heal. So for me, being a Christian is taking accountability for my life. For me, it's about uh, just believing, or just believing in Jesus, and not so much following a set of rules, or doing a cert something, or, or you know, doing a job, or, or anything that's in the Bible, because if you don't believe, you don't know that Jesus is here and it's, it's um, or he existed, I mean. And um, I don't know, it's difficult to be, um, I mean, there's so many different faiths out there and it's hard to, to, I don't know, give me a second, sorry. Um, because without, without uh, I've seen where my life is when I'm not following and when I come back to, to the faith, it helps me to, to, to you know, to get through life, but um, I know there's so many, uh, there's so much negativity in, uh, in about Christians and and stuff out there. But it's just, um, yeah, I'm kind of blanking, but yeah. Great, thanks. I don't like to call myself a Christian to other people, um, but I have no problem calling myself a Christian to myself. The word uh, Christianity and Christian and Jesus were so exploit exploited and overused uh, in my growing up years that I feel a lot of ambivalence about those two titles. Um, the behavior didn't match up with the words. You know, the uh, I don't know if you've seen the billboards over the valley, but there are several of them. I drive around a lot. And on the way down on I-17, just below, I think it's northern, um, it says by, no, let's see. With any reasonable doubt, Jesus is alive. With any reasonable doubt. Now, there's some ambiguity with that. Jesus is alive. And then driving up 7th Avenue, uh, there's a uh, billboard that says, Jesus is coming. Are you prepared? <laughs> So I don't get that. I mean, I do get it. I get it when I translate it into spirit. You know, that's the part that, that lives in me. And I can take uh, the Christ, Jesus the Christ. I think Jesus was, uh, there were many Christs on our planet. We're all called to be the Christ. Um, it's much easier for me to keep it on this level than to have it up there and have it filter down to me because it becomes so corrupted. Uh, so I call myself a Christian to myself. <laughs> um, I've come to see being a Christian not as a static state, but as a dynamic process. Um, so I remember a quote from Maya Angelou. Uh, she said that, um, I'm always surprised when somebody comes to me and says, I'm a Christian, because I want to say, really, already? <laughs> uh, 
she says, I try to be just and loving and compassionate, but um, I know for myself, you know, I've got brief moments of being Christian. And I look back on it and say, my God, I, I was a Christian there. But uh, it really is brief moments that I hope will become uh, fuller as I live my life longer uh, and deeper. And deeper is an important thing for me. I think one of the reasons I want to call myself a Christian is because it's good to claim a tradition that's bigger than me. You know, is it just my feelings at the moment, my ego at the moment that determines what my faith is? Or is there this rich river, this tradition that I can uh, go to to sort of check my ego and check my emotions and say, you know, there's Dorothy Day and there's um, um, Julian of Norwood and there's uh, Susan Valachand and, you know, all these great saints of our tradition that I can compare myself uh, to or learn from. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, to learn from. Thank you, Doug. Um, you all are on my list, too, uh, because we learn from one another in faith and being in spiritual community. And the beauty of this is that, indeed, we're, we're all seekers and on this journey. And um, my, Maya Angelou have our last word today, um, that we are not already. Um, that we haven't arrived to somewhere, but that we're seeking this, this higher power and this, this river and this center and this connection. Um, I know I need it every day. Um, and it's hard for us sometimes to remember as we, we we're so busy serving and doing and think that we um, have this Protestant work ethic of achieving when in fact what we're wanting is to connect is to connect. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> we said last week, you know, when it's important, it's going to be tried to be blocked, you know. So anyway, we're not going to let it be blocked today either, um, the message that's, that's coming through. So thank you so much for sharing. What we're going to move into now is, uh, is communion. Um, and in the Christian tradition, we have two sacraments. That's it. Um, it's baptism and communion. And once a month, we celebrate this. And I think, I think the table that Jesus gave to us as a reminder of this Christian fellowship that gathers around the table, that gathers around a meal to celebrate, uh, to, be, to remember, to commune with each other. And so we have this, this bread and, and juice. And for those of you at home, whatever you have prepared, around or that you can can join in this meal with us that is communal in nature we 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 don't do this faith solo we do it in and with community um as as we become as we become i don't know more followers uh aligned with what i think we saw in jesus which is what many of you you mentioned today so might the meal might the bread and the wine help you to go deeper today, deeper today into your faith, deeper into connecting in community um, and being reminded of, of the journey that we're all on together. Thank you so much for sharing. We'll give these back to our vocalists so they can sing later. Thank you. This is the table indeed that, that has been set before us as, as a reminder and a way for us to simply participate that finally, even though they had beautiful words to say that our words fall short and pretty soon we need to participate in, in the doing, in the tasting, in the in receiving from Christ and so that we come to this table in, in that way and in that spirit. Let us pray. God set before us is this table that reminds us that we are the body together from different backgrounds with 
different understandings and different journeys, and yet we are one, that you see us in that way as all your children. Here we come to feast on this bread and cup that you set before us where all are invited, all are included, all are equal. It gives us a taste of the kingdom that you spoke of. So we breathe into this opportunity and meal together communally as your people. We ask you to bless now both the bread and the wine that in receiving them that we receive you and one another. And we are reminded of, of Jesus today who set before the community in these small groups that would meet together and talk about how to be accountable and how to live in the world and with one another. And it is Jesus who taught us together to pray, saying, Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us join together as one as we receive the gift of bread to satisfy the hunger that we all feel and also to receive the cup to satisfy that which we thirst for. This is the bread of life. This is the cup of liberation. Jesus together at the table and at the meal lifted the bread before them, broke it and blessed it and gave it to them and said, this is my body broken for you. And in the same way, took the cup and poured it out, reminding them too that this was the cup indeed of the new covenant and of liberation. All are welcome to receive this bread and wine and to participate together communally and in the gift that Christ has given. I invite you to, to come forward here to take a piece of bread and to dip it in the juice. And the Debbie will also have the, the gluten-free, so... If you can, not to contaminate that the gluten-free cracker goes into uh, the same uh, juice, not to put the, the gluten bread into the other cup. So thank you, Debbie, for that. And Doug, would you be willing to come and join with me today and do one of the trays? We sing together as we receive communion, one bread, one body.
offer and give of ourselves in so many different ways through, through service, through a phone call, through our care and love for one another. And we have the opportunity to also give financially of our gifts. The baskets will go around um, here in the sanctuary and some of you give through Givelify or through your bank. And we give as a response of what it means to be a Christian, our call of generosity. As we close today with our final song, it is by grace, I think, that we are all here. And if we remember that, too, as the core of who we are, it is also the grace that we extend to others. So let us rise in be body or spirit to sing.
forth from this place as we do every Sunday. We go forth with this benediction of service, but also know that as you go forth from this place that it is God who goes with you, not only to the places that you serve, but the places where you need to find God again as your center, your support, your foundation, and your rock when you're tired and when it's hard. The worship has ended. Let the service begin. Amen.